Greetings, everyone. Welcome. Steve Clemens again. Welcome to our, our first very, very full sessions at INET. We don't believe in small panels. Uh, so at, we have uh, to discuss a decade of stagnation. Please welcome Stephen Bizzari, uh, Bert, the Bert A. and Jeanette L. Lynch, Distinguished Professor of Economics at the Washington University of St. Louis. Uh, we have Antonia, Ant Antoinella Sterati, uh, Professor of Economics at Roma Trey University. Um, and excuse me, and then we have uh, uh, Stephen. We have Adair Turner, who will be with us in a moment, seeing to a few uh, uh, delicate moments outside with the First Minister. Uh, then we have Danielle, Daniela Girardi, or Danielle Girardi, Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Amherst. We have Walter P Paternasi Maloney, Postdoctoral Research Fellow in Economics at Roma Trey University. Thank you for joining us. Our discussant for today will be Till Van Treek, Professor of Socioeconomic Studies and Managing Director of the Institute of Social economics at the University of Duisburg in Essen, Germany, uh, and then the great Anatole Koletsky, who many of you know was chairman of the Institute for New Economic Thinking from 2005 to 2015. He's co-chair and chief economist of Govicol Dragonomics. Anatole, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, uh, I think we should get straight down to business. Uh, the first thing I'll do is reassure you that although there are uh, six, soon to be seven of us on the stage, you're not about to hear seven different papers. Uh, in fact, you're going to hear three uh, substantive papers, uh, first from Antonella, then from Stephen, uh, and then from Adair, uh, uh, a brief comment of 10 minutes or so from Till, and then uh, I will be here to facilitate a discussion uh, amongst the panelists and perhaps with a few minutes for some questions from the floor. Uh, the question we're going to address is really, as uh, the First Minister said, uh, the most important and disturbing question of our times, which is why is it that 10 years after the financial crisis, uh, we still seem to be in a state of global stagnation? Uh, if we can manage to answer that question satisfactorily in the next three papers, then I think we can all go home without the rest of the conference, because that is really uh, at the foundation of so many of the things that are, uh, that are going wrong, both with economics and politics today. Uh, so without wasting any more time on introductions, which Steve was uh, kind enough to give us, uh, he located what all the speakers are, uh, I'll turn it over to Antonella, who's really speaking on behalf of a three-person and team involving also Daniele and Walter. Antonella, you have 15 minutes to present your ideas. Thank you. I hope my slides will appear there, otherwise I'm lost. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, thank you to INET for inviting us and also for financial support to our research. I will present our work on persistent effects of autonomous demand expansions today and then draw some implications for the interpretation of the current stagnation and policy proposals. Um, as you know, uh, there, has been a long, there is a long-standing macroeconomic conventional wisdom that says that aggregate demand shocks are at the origin of short-run cyclical fluctuation of the economy, but that uh, in between this cycle, the economy always tends to return to a potential output, to an equilibrium output, which is determined by supply factors, and in New Keynesian models, it's also determined by institutions. So, potential output and the associated narrow are seen as attractors towards which the economy tends to return. In our research, we wanted to assess such tendency and question, such tendency to return to an independently determined potential output, indep independent, uh, that is, from aggregate demand shocks. Uh, and we test that, what happens after an autonomous demand expansion. So we explore uh, if there are persistent effects of expansions on GDP and other uh, uh, macroeconomic variables. So th this is, not, I mean, the, the conventional wisdom has already been ch challenged in the past by literature and empirical evidence concerning GDP unit roots and hysteresis. There has been a real business cycle interpretation of this, saying that cycle and trend are determined by the same factor, that is, they are determined by supply side factors. The new Keynesian interpretation has been different, and it has been, since there is empirical evidence that uh, 
uh, aggregate demand drives most cyclical fluctuations, then both cycle and trend would be driven by aggregate demand. And this is a recent statement by Katas and Summers in 2016. However, very often the literature on hysteresis has been, has been dealing with large and negative, negative aggregate demand shocks, generally implying that subsequent expansions would be inflationary. So our research questions and empirical results have a two-sided connection with this hysteresis literature. In line with that literature, we try to assess whether there are persistent effects of aggregate demand shocks, particularly in its autonomous components. On the other hand, in contrast with that literature, first we test whether such persistence is detected also when there is an expansion of aggregate demand. And in addition, we look at effects on actual variables, on actual GDP and other macroeconomic variables, and not on unobservable and only indirectly estimated ones, such as potential output and the uh, In order to do that, we build our uh, autonomous demand variable, which is, a, which, uh, is a sum of primary public spending and exports. And we construct this variable for a panel of 34 OECD countries between 1960 and 2015. Then we identify expansion episodes as country year large percentage increase of this autonomous demand variable. Large means one standard deviation above the country mean. And in this way, we identify 94 episodes of expansion, um, which we study or compare against a control group, which consists of more than 1,000 country years where expansions did not take place, not, not the large expansions. And then we use local projection to estimate the effect in different specification. Uh, the results I will present here briefly are those related, uh, as, as are those that we derive from the fixed effect model. Uh, in, and then, of course, I shall move to the interpretation of the findings and their implication for destination and policy making. This is the, describes the path of the autonomous demand variable in the country, uh, in, the, in the expansion episodes and afterwards. So in the expansion episode, the uh, autonomous demand is 5% higher in the 94 expansion episodes versus the control group. Then it remains above the a positive gap remains, but uh, a bit uh, smaller. Of course, there is a key challenge to this kind of empirical analysis, which is that the, our autonomous demand variable could, in fact, be endogenous. There could be reverse causality or omitted variables, uh, uh, which renders both autonomous demand and dependent variables, GDP and others, uh, depend on the same uh, other variables, omitted variables. So to, to check for this, we control for initial conditions. We look at some key macroeconomic variables in um, one year before the expansion in the, ex in the, uh, in the group that represent the expansion episode and the control group to check if there are differences between these two groups. And what we find in the third column is that if we control for country and year fixed effects, uh, there are no signif statistically significant differences in the year before the expansion between our episodes of expansion and the control group for a number of important variables such as labor productivity growth, GDP growth, etc. The main difference concerns the fact that the uh, expansion countries have a slightly devalued real exchange rate compared to the control group. So this is what happens to GDP, to the gap between GDP in the 94 units that have experienced an, exp an expansion in, in, a, in um, autonomous demand and the control group uh, in, in the 10 years after the expansion. GDP remains higher in, uh, in the um, expansion units, 
Uh, and in the end, the gap stabilizes at the end of the 10 years. So after 10 years, there is still a 3% difference in GDP in the countries that have experienced an, an, an autonomous demand expansion. There is no sign of mean reversion, and hence there is no sign of a return to a predetermined path which is independent of autonomous demand. On the contrary, if we look at inflation, we see that there is a positive extra inflation in the countries experiencing here and countries experiencing an expansion, but this is very small and is not statistically significant. We have uh, significant, both, both economically and statistically significant effects on the capital stock, which increases particularly in the component structures and machinery. And we have positive persistent effects and statistically significant on labor productivity, employment, unemployment, which of course falls, and um, uh, participation rate. On the other hand, we have only a medium run effect on long term unemployment. Uh, in the paper, you can find a number of tests and different specification, et cetera, which all confirm, I will not go into details here, but they all confirm these results. So what, what do they tell us in comparison with current literature, these uh, empirical results? They are, they, of course, they are in contrast with the macroeconomic wisdom uh, we have uh, illustrated at the, at the beginning, autonomous demand expansions have persistent effect on GDP, so there is no crowding out of other components of private demand. Um, and also, in contrast with some of this thesis literature, we find that expansion do not generally cause accelerating inflation, nor even stable but high inflation. The effect of inflation is very uh, small and dispersed, there is, uh, the statistical significance is not there. Um, we also find that productivity, capital formation, labor force participation that are normally regarded as su supply side factors determining growth, in fact are to some extent endogenous to changes to, uh, in uh, the, uh, the autonomous demand. Particularly important is our findings about capital formation, which is probably a, f a factor explaining such a persistence of the effects of autonomous demand expansions. This is, I, I would like to underline that these results are very much um, in line with a lot of, of empirical evidence about aggregate investments, private investments, being determined essentially by lagged output or aggregate demand. So what is a consist, uh, frame, an analytical framework that would be consistent with these findings? I think uh, such framework should have three main premises or propositions, and I think all of them can be found to be analytically and empirically supported. The first proposition is, the, is in fact the Keynesian principle of effective demand. So in any given period, aggregate demand and output can differ from what and be planned by firms, so capacity cannot be used in the degree planned by firms originally, and there can be unemployment, uh, unemployed labor. The second proposition is that this discrepancy between aggregate demand and production and installed capacity can be lasting long enough to cause firms to be willing to adjust their capacity, i.e. to determine private investment. As we have seen, there is a lot of evidence that this is the case. And the third proposition is, is needed to explain how is it possible that we have at the same time expansion, normally we have at the same time expansion of public spending, other components of autonomous demand, consumption goods, investment goods. Hmm? How is it possible that output expands in all sectors of the economy? Of, of course, this, I'm done. <laughs> this, <laughs> of course, this um, requires that uh, uh, there are some, that some labor unemployed, uh, 
hidden unemployment or explicit unemployment, and that plans can be used more intensely, which is normally the case because the planned or average degree of utilization of plants is normally below the physical maximum. So these analytical premises were in fact discussed long ago in some papers by Garegnani, one of which has been recently republished. So one, one implication uh, is of our results is that the trade-off in macroeconomic policy, the usual trade-off in macroeconomic policy is overturned. That is to say, autonomous demand expansions bring about persistent effect on GDP, whereas they bring about only sh if short run and small effects on inflation, if any. Hmm? The effects on inflation are very uncertain. So what are the implications for our subject, the post-2008 uh, stagnation? The implications are quite obvious. Uh, that is that persistent effects of aggregate demand shocks are a quite pervasive phenomenon. Uh, there are also many papers uh, showing this in the case of recessions and fiscal consolidations. So it, they don't seem to be peculiar to this phase in some sense. What appears to be peculiar to, to, to the post-2008 uh, situation is the size of the, negative, of the initial negative shocks associated to the financial crisis and the combination of a number of concurrent factors such as high and increasing inequality, austerity policies, private debt deleveraging, uh, large trade imbalances, which all tend to depress aggregate demand so that I think that aggregate, that demand factors can quite well explain the long stagnation, which also imply that these results give support to two positions that have already been, points that have already been made, that fiscal expansion would be a much more effective way out of the stagnation than monetary policy alone, and that there is no reason to expect that this would lead to accelerating or even high inflation. Thank you very much. Antonella, thank you very much. I think that was a very appropriate paper with which to start this entire conference because it simultaneously, as you said at the end, not ju didn't just challenge but overturned so much of the conventional wisdom and in a way which suggests that economics doesn't need to be just a dismal science in which negative shocks persist, but could also be a positive science in which improvements can also persist. Steve, now you're going to talk about how some of these ideas are reflected in what's going on in America today, I think. Yes, thank you very much, Anatole. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, to join this interesting group in this big, kind of big room. Uh, I will say it's not the biggest audience I've ever spoken to before. Uh, that, will, that will always be a group of about 1,200 screaming first-year students and their parents in the background, or a total of 5,000. Uh, we'll never quite get to that level, but it's, uh, uh, th this will be a little more academic context of that, and I look forward to it. Uh, so uh, Anatole, uh, Antonella gave us a very, nice, uh, a very nice presentation with you know, very strong empirical results about the importance of demand. In some ways, what I'll ask you to do is to say that the results that she showed are, are in fact, symmetric. And so when we have negative demand uh, shocks or negative demand dynamics that we get stagnation as the result as, see, as she suggested at the end of her presentation and show you the argument here will be that this is what's happening in the U.S. economy in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So uh, we've had a decade of uh, secular stagnation. Let me just summarize what, I, what I'd like to do, what is, is discussed in much more detail and what turned out to be a much lengthier paper than I thought and is available on the conference site. So uh, I'll just say basically one chart uh, uh, to, to argue that stagnation, we have stagnation in the United States in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Given low unemployment, uh, relatively stable growth, this is a, maybe a little bit of a controversial uh, point of view, but I, I think the evidence is really quite strong. I'll talk a little bit about how to explain uh, stagnation. Uh, Antonella has actually covered some of the material, so I can move quickly through that, but supply side versus demand side explanations. And the core of what I want to say this morning is that the, the empirical case is strong, that in fact it is not supply, it's demand, 
in contrast with the conventional wisdom. And then if I have a few minutes at the end, I'll talk about the link between that and rising inequality. Uh, as always, I want to thank the generous support of INET for this work and, and other projects that have led into to what you'll see today, and to acknowledge my, uh, my co-author in this, my former student, Barry Cinnamon, who's uh, been a partner for me in all of this work. So uh, one chart uh, on, on secular stagnation in the United States uh, that, uh, that I think gets the headline, uh, the headline uh, analysis. In the paper, I talk a bit about labor force participation, capacity utilization, uh, the, uh, the change in the forecast of the Congressional Budget Office of potential output and various other indicators that all come together. But I think in, in, a, in terms of a quick presentation, this one captures the idea the best. What I've done is calculated the peak to peak uh, growth over the past uh, five business cycles, the last one not complete, uh, of real GDP growth per capita. And you can see quite obviously in the data there that the first three cycles, really 25 years of history, there was a lot of similarity, uh, running uh, just from just below to just above 2% per capita per year. In the early 2000s, there was a slowdown, significant slowdown. But the, the recent cycle has been dramatic. Uh, with, with less than 1% growth. Now, first obvious point is that the, uh, the, the, the current cycle is not complete. Uh, is, in my point of view, a, a recession in the U.S. is not imminent. Uh, so, and the U.S. is growing faster than 0.6% per year. So this number is creeping upward. In fact, when I first put these data together about a year ago, it was 0.5%. Uh, but that kind of shows the point, given the relatively slow growth of the economy, this number is almost certainly going to be low for a long time to come. In the paper, I give the example that if you had 2.5% growth for six years steady from now going forward, you still would be below the, the, the early 2000s and way below the earlier history. So, uh, you know, secular stagnation in this context and this way of looking at it is a reality and again supported by other kinds of data. Now, how do we think about this? Uh, the, the mainstream way, of course, is to think about this, as Antonella mentioned, through a supply side theoretical lens. Basically, in the world of the neoclassical synthesis, Keynesian short run, classical or supply driven long run. Uh, you know, how do you get there? The old view would be nominal adjustment, wage and price adjustment would move you from a Keynesian short run to a, a classical long run. The newer version over the last 20 years of new Keynesian macroeconomics doesn't rely so much on price and wage adjustment, but more on wise monetary policy, but uh, is generally viewed that this is, th this is the way we get to, to full employment. And so if you're looking at persistent stagnation through this theoretical lens, uh, 10 years since the previous peak, more than eight years since the trough, that we are beyond the short run. And there we, therefore, we have to think about the problems coming from the supply side. But of course, uh, there, there's another way of looking at this. Again, Antonella has already introduced these ideas uh, that, that the neoclassical synthesis is, is in, from, from my point of view, my entire career I viewed, viewed as, a, as a weak read in the, uh, in the structure of mainstream macroeconomics. Uh, can we rely on wage and price adjustment? I think it's generally agreed no, that deflation is generally a bad thing. Disinflation is difficult. Uh, I think the more provocative thing I would like to talk about, mention today, is that we also, in my view, can't really rely on monetary policy. That uh, the, the, the standard tool for monetary policy, interest rate adjustment, is, it does not have a lot of leverage on aggregate demand that uh, conventional uh, interest elasticities of consumption and business investment are actually quite low. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is something I've been saying for a long time to my students. I will say I missed some of the power of monetary policy early in, earlier in my career because, in fact, I think in the U.S. it did work reasonably effectively to stimulate the economy in the great moderation period from the middle 1980s up until the eve of the Great Recession, but largely by creating financial instability, by uh, not so much encouraging people to sustainably substitute from the future to the present, as the standard models would suggest, but by encouraging households to borrow unsustainably against their houses. And in the end, this didn't work out very well, uh, as my former colleague and co-author Hyman Minsky emphasized so much. Uh, so uh, when monetary policy works, in my view, it largely works by creating financial instability. Where this leads me is to this controversy about the natural rate of interest. I kind of question whether, whether the thing really exists, and even if it does exist at a point in time, I would argue that it's quite volatile. If you think of a simple loanable funds world where you have very steep investment, very steep saving curves, any shifts in those curves are going to cause a huge change in the so-called natural interest rate. And that it's often negative. It's most of the time negative in many ways. And if I had more time, I could talk about some empirical evidence that demand is constraining the economy most of the time in some sense, which would suggest uh, 
uh, the natural rate is not terribly helpful for practical reasons. So uh, from my point of view, the zero bound is not the main issue, and that's where I might differ some with other people that look at this issue. So where, where we're coming from is that there is no endogenous market or policy mechanism to restore demand to potential output beyond the short run, and that demand growth dynamics are the engine of economic activity. So the key part of our work here is to look at the evidence. Uh, I, I, there's more specific evidence on the supply side story in the paper. Just summarizing it very quickly, uh, I think there's more slack in the labor market than regularly you know, suggested with participation rates and hidden unemployment. Business investment's not as slow as some people have suggested when you take into account the fact that the economy has been stagnant. But there's a key test, a kind of obvious Econ 101 type of test, or at least Econ 201, which is that if you have a supply-driven stagnation, uh, somehow you have to choke off the excess demand. What's the primary mechanism? A rise in the real interest rate. Have real interest rates risen? Simply, no. Uh, kind of obvious point there. I show a, a number of different uh, measures of the real interest rate, but in particular, I want to highlight the, uh, the heavy dark line on the chart, which is the, uh, the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities market measure of the real rate of interest. Uh, certainly hasn't risen. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Uh, so no evidence of supply side stagnation. What about the demand side? Well, this chart is based on work that Barry Cinnamon and I have done with INET support over the last few years. And it measures uh, what we call household demand. So we're correcting for uh, 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 implicit or, or imputed kinds of, uh, uh, of things in personal consumption expenditure. We're moving things like gov government finance medical care out of this to talk about the, the cash uh, spending that really comes from the household sector. It doesn't change the story dramatically from standard personal consumption expenditure, but we think it is the more relevant measure. And uh, take, a, take a quick look at this chart. There's some obvious obvious points here. Uh, the, uh, the heavy line, of course, is the actual measure of inflation-adjusted household demand. The, the little dotted line is a, is a very simple-minded trend, just, just connecting uh, in a ge geometric trend 2000 to 2006, the peak to peak of the recent cycle. You notice, though, that backcasting that trend in the, back to 1990, and you can even go further back, doesn't do too badly. The household demand was largely following this. It dipped a bit in the recessions of the early 90s and the early 2000s, but, but then rejoined the trend. Uh, obviously, what happened in the context of the Great Recession is, is just fundamentally different. A much deeper drop and really no recovery to speak of towards trend. In fact, that gap is growing uh, over time. By 2016, we're talking about uh, a 21% drop. I mean, it's, 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 it's just stunning in some sense. Now, you might argue, and correctly in my view, that the, uh, the earlier trend was unsustainable in the way it was being financed. I would agree with that. However, uh, that was demand we needed to, you know, to move the economy, even at a relatively mediocre expansion. And we simply lost it. We have not recovered it. Here's another way to look at, at similar kinds of things, but with more historical comparison, where I've indexed household demand per capita uh, to 100 at the beginning of the last few cycles. And you, you can see the growth path there. I won't emphasize this so much. But again, the heavy line, uh, the, the drop much further, the recovery much slower. So on a per capita basis with this measure, we still, after 10 years, have not recovered the peak of household demand. This is demand stagnation. Uh, in the context of this, and most of our research recently is focused on the household sector, but trying to broaden out the perspective, in the paper I look at other things, investment and exports, but I did want to show this, this one chart on the government. It's really quite striking. So this is a, a bit of an unusual measure of government spending, so I'm using government consumption and investment, the standard G in the, in the GDP equation, uh, but I'm also adding government, in the U.S., government finance medical care. That's out of our household demand measure, but it's something the government's paying for, and I didn't want to understate government growth, because medical care has been growing fast. Uh, and uh, it wanted to make sure that's included. And you can see, in fact, that uh, there was a bit of an inflection point in the late 2000s, around the time of September 11th, the Iraq War, rising government spending. It was actually moving along at a pretty, pretty fast clip, about a little over 4% per year in real terms. Uh, and that actually kept going. This trend is 2000 to 2006. But you see, we move along that trend, really through 2009, dropped just a bit below it in 2010. Uh, in the early years of the Great Recession, the expansion did lead to higher government spending. But uh, ever since then, the pivot to austerity, the uh, U.S. Uh, government spending has really flatlined. And another drag on demand from this point of view, important in the context of Antonella's presentation, a, a really fundamental part of autonomous demand. <laughs> 
So uh, I'm getting close to the end here. Uh, let me talk about a somewhat nuanced role for inequality in all of this uh, stagnant demand. Uh, it's kind of natural, many of us in the room have talked about income distribution and demand for decades. Uh, uh, the, the pretty straightforward argument, uh, basically when you get more income at the top end of the income distribution, there are two factors that lead high income people to spend a smaller share. One is that fundamentally they're able to save more, accumulate more wealth for the future, their propensity to consume is lower. But in addition, not as often recognized, they pay a higher tax rate. And so as a result, as you redistribute more of the income growth, you have this recycling problem that is not as effective of, of taking income and recycling it back into demand. Into demand. The, the, the argument's fairly obvious, but there's this fundamental timing problem, which is inequality in the U.S. started rising in the late 1970s or the early 1980s, depend upon where you want to time that, whereas the stagnant demand problem has really hit us in the last 10 years. Uh, the basic argument in our research is that the borrowing and spending era of the, of the pre-recession uh, decades postponed this demand drag. But now it's, now it's come home to roost. Now we're seeing the effect of inequality. The Great Recession uh, forced the middle class demand to go down. They could no longer borrow and finance uh, uh, demand beyond with the borrowing. And the paper provides more detail on this argument. But we needed that demand. We had, uh, and, and we've lost it. It hasn't, it hasn't returned. So in a model that's very related to the work that Antonella talked about, a theoretical model that we, that we calibrated with some simple changes in income distribution, we've argued that uh, you can explain at least a 10% gap in the economy as the result of rising inequality. So uh, my final slide, what are the consequences? We've had a so-called disappointing recovery and secular stagnation beyond the, uh, beyond the short run. Now you might say, what about the statistics? In fact, I just checked. According to the United States Congressional Budget Office, the, uh, the official demand gap between potential output and actual output is basically zero for the first time now since the Great Recession. Uh, what's going on? Well, uh, following again some of the evidence that Antonella talked about, you know, that basically demand is leading supply, that the stagnant demand is pulling down business investment, not so much as the share of the economy, but uh, in overall, because we have slow growth, uh, it's hurting labor productivity, it's hurting labor supply growth, labor participation, immigration, et cetera, that in some sense it's the dumbing down of the U.S. economy. We you know, recognize the importance of you know, rising household leverage in the, in the uh, pre-crisis years and knew that we had to go through a deleveraging process that would be difficult, at least most of us knew that, uh, but it's not enough. Uh, with this inequality argument and, you know, now that we're well into this, you know, uh, deleveraging period, we're still not seeing household demand catch up. And, and I think the government uh, numbers are, are significant that the kind of calls for lower government spending straight up without fundamentally addressing demand is troublesome. You know, what, what will be our engine of demand growth going forward? Uh, I don't think I have too much more time to, to talk about this, but I'll leave you with one last chart. This is based on, uh, on some of our earlier work, only goes through 2012 because of data limitations. But this indexes uh, our, our measure of, of standard demand uh, from, uh, from the household sector, personal consumption expenditure, for the top 5%, the dotted line, and the, uh, and, and the bottom 95% of the income distribution, the solid line. And as you can see, that while these were kind of tracking together for a while, they diverged in the middle 1990s, and any stimulus is coming from, from household spending of the affluent, which is uh, probably not the way we'd like to see our economy develop over time. So I'll stop there and be happy to, to hear questions and, and discussion, and I'll be at the rest of the conference. Feel free to, to uh, follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Another inversion of conventional wisdom. I like the idea of the inverse says law. And the one point you didn't make at the end is that all the trends you're describing are guaranteed to get worse in the United States in the next few years. Uh, Adair. I'm going to stay seated because I've got some notes and I knew I would have to adjust what I was going to say given what uh, Antonella and Steve said. And it's just easiest if I do that uh, since there isn't a, uh, a, a podium to talk at. Um, I'm going to end up with one slide at the end, which is an attempt to set out what I think is the interconnection between many of the different things that are leading to a secular stagnation. But let me uh, build up to it. Um, the first question has really been answered by Steve, which is what do we mean by a, a decade of, of stagnation? Is there a decade of stagnation? So I'm going to flip over my first three slides very quickly to simply say there has been incredibly low real growth per capita in the advanced economies. Uh, that has been linked to incredibly low growth in 
nominal demand uh, and therefore inflation rates and therefore uh, interest rates. And that has been reflected also in a really quite dramatic long-term trend in the fall in the real uh, interest rate, which I think is best measured by the yield to maturity on an index-linked bond. And all I've done on this chart is average it over five-year periods. And when you average it over five-year periods, you end up thinking that there's something secular uh, going on here uh, rather than simply uh, you know, tactical and short-term. And so I think the evidence is clear that there is something very strange going on in our economy and that it is primarily a demand side issue rather than a slowing down in the growth rate of the technological frontier, which, as it were, condemns us to a low rate of growth. It strikes me that there are then two main uh, ways of explaining that. One, one is the sort of debt overhang argument and the other that there's something more uh, fundamental and uh, secular. And I'm going to primarily focus on the uh, secular one. The debt overhang one is absolutely core to my own book between uh, debt and the devil, and it's been uh, frequently uh, put forward. It, it essentially says, look, the 2007 crisis, uh, eight crisis is preceded by an incredible growth of private domestic credit as a percent of GDP uh, across the advanced economies. Uh, that, as uh, Maurice Schullerich, Oscar Yorder, and Alan Taylor have shown us, is fundamentally uh, about real estate lending. When you have lending against uh, real estate or any asset which is at least in short term in limited supply because of its positional nature, you tend to get these incredibly self-reinforcing cycles of increased credit extended, drives asset prices, drives more credit extended in a sort of Minsky cycle, a Minsky cycle which eventually produces a crash. And in the aftermath of that crash, you've got so much leverage uh, in the economy that that is a depressive effect on demand. And that in a sense, as I put it, the debt never goes away. It simply moves around the economy from the non-financial private sector to the government sector. You can see the pattern here with Japan. And unless you allow it to move around by running large deficits and by allowing the stock of public debt to go up, you will have depressed growth. So I very much agree with Steve's analysis, with Antonella's analysis, that once you are in a debt overhang problem, once you have created a huge body of debt, and this is described, for instance, by uh, Atif Mian and, Mian, uh, uh, and Amir Sufi in their book, House of Debt, you are in an environment where monetary policy will not be effective, that the elasticity of response is ineffective, and that you fundamentally have to use fiscal policy to keep the government going at that level. And also I, uh, as many of you know, will have then gone to the heretical stance that if you think there's a limit to that, there isn't a limit, because at the limit, you can monetarily finance uh, fiscal deficit if you really think you are absolutely out of ammunition. So all of that says that I think there is a very strong debt overhang element uh, to this uh, period of low growth that we've had. But it's the secular stagnation one on which I want uh, to focus, because I think there's a reasonable argument that there's something more fundamental that's gone on and that it was going on even before 2008, and it isn't just uh, about debt. And as I said just a few minutes ago, I think one of the reasons that make you think that is this very long-term fall uh, in long-term uh, real interest rates. This suggests that it isn't simply a product of what happens after uh, 2008. Sometimes when I talk about long-term real interest rates being very low, people say, oh, that's just quantitative easing, et cetera. But this says it isn't quantitative easing. Uh, the final bit of the fall can be contributed to by quantitative easing, but we're clearly looking at a long-term effect. And I think once you start looking at long-term real interest rates rather than short-term and uh, nominal interest rates, it is reasonable uh, to go back to some fundamentals that we must be thinking about some change in the balance between ex-ante attempted savings and ex-ante desired or attempted uh, investment. Either something with inequality increasing the marginal propensity, with higher people having a higher marginal propensity to save, rising inequality increases the attempted marginal propensity to save of the whole society. That produces an attempted increase in savings rate which, if not matched by uh, an increased uh, need for investment, will tend to uh, shift the, um, uh, uh, the equilibrium real interest rate uh, down. 
So I think we should be looking for some of these long-term structural things. And there's a whole set of candidate ideas as to what has produced this change in the balance and what has made it difficult for us to achieve enough aggregate nominal demand to stay up uh, with the frontier of, of, of technological possibility, a frontier which, of course, may itself be somewhat endogenous uh, to uh, the level of demand. There's a very good paper, uh, Bank of England, uh, Rachel uh, and Smith, which attempts a simple, uh, a, a commonsensical, quantitative as best as possible, uh, decomposition of why we've had such a large fall in what they describe as the neutral real rate, but one might think of that having a relationship to the real long-term uh, 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 index rate. And they look at changes in expectations of future growth, but that could be endogenous, possible demographic effects, higher inequality, a nation savings glut, cheaper capital goods, etc. I want to focus in particular on the cheaper capital goods one and then relate it to what I think is some important changes in the nature of where wealth is in a modern economy and then put up my one chart in which I'm going to try and suggest what I think is going on, not because I know that that's the answer, but because I hope that that will stimulate people to think uh, about a possible framework for it. It strikes me that we do live in a world where there is another major long-term trend at work, similar to that long-term trend. Have a look at a very similar chart, which is advanced economy investment as a percent of GDP. And if you simply do another very straightforward five-year averages, you see a very significant fall uh, in those uh, percentages. Now, looking at this, a lot of people interpret this as a problem which has derived from the financialization of the economy, the short-termism of business, uh, people doing uh, share buybacks rather than investing in real productive assets. And I don't deny that that may be a part of the story. But I think it's at least possible that part of the story also is that capital goods are just getting cheaper. We live in a world in which capital goods increasingly mean information and communication software. And the hardware keeps on getting cheaper because of Moore's law. And software has this remarkable feature that the marginal cost of replication is zero that once you've got one copy of a piece of hardware, uh, software, the next billion copies don't cost you anything. And I think it's not surprising when you realize that capital investment is increasingly ICT, that we then find in IMF figures the fact that if you look at the cost of plant and machinery, what that is doing relative to the general price level, that in is in also a steady long-time decline. Essentially, in capital goods, we get more bang for our buck from what we pay uh, in nominal dollar amounts for capital goods. And that explains a extraordinary strong, uh, helps explain an extraordinarily strong phenomenon in our modern economies, which is these, as in business we say, capital light uh, business models, these examples of extraordinary market value creation with relatively little investment and very low employment. Facebook is now worth about $400 billion. It only employs about 15, that may have gone up to about 18,000 people. What's really interesting to work out, how much investment did Facebook have to do before Facebook existed? By investment, as economists, we need that mean the devotion of labor, not to providing current goods and services, but to building the machine out of which you provide future goods and services. My calculation is that the machine which was Facebook was created by something like 5,000 software engineer years. This is region, you know, uh, uh, what is it? We're talking 40, 50 million dollars of equity value per software engineer year that gets put in. As a ratio between equity value and what you have to put in for investment, this is a completely different economy than when Henry Ford had to build a factory and somebody had to build a steel foundry to help make the machinery that went into his factory before he could create value. So we live in a world in which plant and machinery in its modern forms is getting uh, cheaper uh, and in which therefore the value of the cost of capital, the, 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 the cost of physical capital, not the rate of return, uh, is getting lower. We also live in a world, quite noticeably, however, in which the value of the capital that we don't create, which is existing real estate and land, goes up. 
Uh, all of us, of course, have uh, read every single one of the 800 pages of Thomas Piketty's uh, Capitalism in the 21st Century. Uh, and therefore, we have looked at these charts. And of course, Thomas uh, explains this very significant increase in the wealth to income ratio that we have seen in uh, modern economies over the last 50 years. But the, it's the point that Thomas does not himself stress, and I exchanged with him and asked him why he does not, but it is in his own charts, because this is just taken straight from his book, is that almost all of that increase in most of those advanced economies uh, is not in plant and machinery, it is in real estate. And as Morris Schulerich has shown uh, in an important paper, all of all that increase in real estate is essentially explained by the value of land, positionally specific land. We live in this high-tech uh, environment where the single biggest thing which creeps on increasing in value is the most physical thing of all old-fashioned land. Here's what I think is going on. I think that information communications technology is incredibly powerful, and we'll be coming back to discuss that. Uh, Bill Janeway and I are probably uh, going to have a discussion uh, at, at, at dinner about this uh, this evening. I think it's an immensely powerful technology, uh, which has some really unique effects. I think it is producing a rising inequality at both the bottom and uh, the top ends of the income uh, distribution. And I think it is producing a falling need and demand for capital goods. I think the interface between the attempted increased savings of the rich with a high marginal propensity to save and a falling need for capital goods produces an environment where there is a potential deficiency of demand unless you have very low equilibrium real wage rates, uh, real interest rates, which enable lower income people to then borrow money to make up for the deficiency of real wages. I think you then uh, add the fact that we create a crisis and you have ultra loose monetary policy, I think it reinforces that. I think paradoxically, in a world of information and communications technology, which drives so much productive power that we achieve a sort of satiation in physical produced goods or services, we should expect to see a rising demand for positional goods. That as people don't need more washing machines, more cars and more clothes, they will logically uh, uh, allocate an increasing percentage of their income to competing with one another for the right to live in the nice part of town. You will produce a rise in the demand for positional goods real estate. That will produce a rise in the wealth to income ratio, primarily in real estate. When you then add the fact that banks, contrary to a simplistic theory in which banks are intermediators of previously existing money, once you add the fact that banks create credit money and purchasing power that did not previously exist, the easiest thing to do, seen from a private banking perspective, is to lend that money against real estate, which then drives a further twist of that circle. Overall, therefore, my conclusion is I do think we have some fundamental drivers of secular stagnation, uh, which I think, thank you very much, Steve, uh, which uh, uh, I think in the period before 2008, and Steve has touched on this, I think were only held at bay by rising leverage, but were there. I think we have had a crisis and debt overhang which has revealed uh, the, those fundamental factors, but which has exacerbated that fundamental problem uh, with uh, the additional problems of debt overhang. So I don't think it's just a debt overhang. I think we have some very fundamental and interconnected secular stagnation factors at work in our economy. Thanks. So, Till, what do you make of all that? Clicker. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. And let me start by uh, apologizing in advance to the three presenters um, for not being able, obviously, to do justice to the complexity of their arguments uh, in, 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 in 10 minutes. Um, uh, I, I learned a lot from the papers. I like them very much. And, and I picked a couple of aspects that I would like to, 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 to comment on. So um, starting with Antonella's um, presentation. So I was very curious in the paper to look at this um, uh, a table. 
that shows the identified um, uh, um, years of uh, autonomous uh, demand expansion uh, in, in the sample that you're using. And so because I'm uh, uh, from Germany, I'm obviously interested in, in, in the Eurozone and worried about the Eurozone. What I found interesting was that, in fact, the only two Eurozone countries um, that had an or that experience an autonomous demand expansion after 2000 in your sample were Germany and Netherlands. Um, so the two main current account surplus um, uh, countries. Uh, and, and, and so let's look at this chart here for, for, for Germany. So as you all know, Germany um, in the 2000s under, underwent a period of rather substantial um, fiscal consolidation. So the orange line that you can see here shows the cyclically adjusted government balance for Germany. So it goes up from 2002 to 2007. So this was the fiscal consolidation that the Germans are very proud of, obviously, uh, uh, in retrospect. During a time when the output gap uh, widened, so that was a, a time of, 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 of recession and, 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 and a rather long, long slump. But now look at the, the, uh, the gray bars. Um, this is uh, the growth contribution of real experts. They were, and this is what in your paper, uh, Antonella, I think drives the autonomous uh, demand uh, expansion uh, for, the mo for the main part. It was not, not only, it was, it was very significant not only in 2006, but during f four years at least uh, between 2003 and 2007. So Germany, uh, while doing this fiscal consolidation was uh, to some extent uh, rather lucky. Um, now look at what happened to, to Spain in, uh, between 2009 and 2014. Um, there was an even more substantial fiscal consolidation going on, obviously, and, and an even stronger uh, uh, recession. But the, the, the growth contribution of exports was obviously much weaker because uh, foreign demand wasn't um, as strong uh, as it was for Germany in the 2000s because at that time Germany was the only Eurozone country that was con consolidating, whereas, of course, now everyone is consolidating. So um, that's why we... we, we uh, as you uh, pointed to in your paper, experienced this, this, um, this very long-lasting stagnation, uh, not only in the Eurozone, but, but uh, a little bit elsewhere, but it's, it's, much, it's much more severe in the Eurozone. So that, that I found very interesting uh, when, when looking at, at your paper. Um, so turning to, to, to the two papers by, by um, or presentations by Stephen and Adair, what I like a, a lot about uh, those two papers, uh, among other, many other things, was that they referred to the argument that uh, one, before, so there is this link between income inequality and the crisis, which I think we can't uh, ignore. So the first part of the argument is before the crisis, demand was actually kept strong because high saving by top income groups was channeled into borrowing by lower income groups uh, who tried to keep up with the rich in terms of positional um, consumption. And now after the crisis or with the crisis, and this is a quote from, from Steve's paper, the economy's central function to recycle income back into demand is deeply compromised precisely because an over-indebted middle class can now no longer absorb the high savings by businesses and top income uh, uh, households. So um, Adair talks in his, talked in his presentation a lot about the significance of positional goods, and I think this is very important to, to look at. So in my reading of the evidence, one could argue that neoliberalism has, in fact, generated a new feeling of need um, in the middle class through rising income inequality. What you see here um, in the green bar is the actual rise in median real family income for th three periods in the United States. The first period is from 1947 to 1967. The se then the, the real family median income increased by 80%. Between 1967 and 1987, real median family income increased by approximately 30%. And from 1987 to 2007, approximately 15%. What is interesting is the red bar. This is the subjective minimum income based on a Gallup poll. So the Gallup poll asks the following question. What is the smallest amount of yearly income a family of four would need to get along in your local community? You can see that from 1947 to 67, it increased approximately at the same rate as actual real incomes. But between 67 and 87, the subjective minimum income uh, the median subjective minimum income in the U.S. actually shrank. So there are some signs of satiation, as, as um, uh, um, Adair calls it, in terms of 
um, basic material uh, needs. But then from 87 to 2007, the subjective minimum income actually increases much faster than the actual real income. So there is this new uh, feeling of, of need in the middle class. So I agree, I, I strongly agree with, uh, with Stephen um, uh, that we need now to create a high pressure economy, as you call it in the paper, in the short run, because we need to restore income growth broadly across the distribution. And we need economic growth to do that because middle class incomes need to rise. I also agree that in order to create a high pressure economy, we need expansionary fiscal policy, so monetary policy clearly won't do the job. We need a more equal distribution of income because the middle class um, is over indebted and needs to deleverage. Uh, so, uh, and the top one or the top 5% are not going to provide sufficient consumption spending to pull, out, pull the economy out of, out of the, the current stagnation. I also agree that investment will probably take care of itself if the de demand growth path accelerates. This is also a point that Antonella made. However, I'm a little bit, I, I think this is controversial about, about the question of whether it's actually desirable or an end in itself to avoid stagnation even in the long run. Is that, do we always need high growth and a high pressure economy? So I would like to point to the ecological boundaries that I think you didn't talk about in your, in your three papers, but I think that they must be on the table. And one could also argue then, when looking at the evidence from this minimum income question, and there is more empirical evidence uh, along similar lines, there were some signs actually of egalitarian stagnation in the 1970s, and we shouldn't forget that they can be interpreted as an indication of social progress and a potential satiation of need. Um, so is it necessarily the case when basic uh, material needs are satiated then that, that people will necessarily turn to positional goods. I always ask my students, would you rather prefer in a world in which everyone worked 20 hours per week and the real standard of living was that of the 1970s, or would you rather all work 40 hours per week and have today's standard of living? And uh, the typical result is that three quarters of my students say they would much rather work only 20 hours and have a lower standard of living. The, the, the problem, of course, is here we have a collective action problem because b everyone decides on their working hours uh, and consumption individually. So there, of course, they are competing. But as a society as a whole, I'm not so sure if, if, if we necessarily should devote more resources to positional spending on positional goods or if we should not try and consume, as it were, more non-positional goods that are also very valuable. And, 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 and leisure, obviously, is a is a non-positional goods. You cannot show off with your leisure, at, at least not in today's world. Neoliberalism has created the urgent need for growing middle class incomes in the short run because the rise in inequality has exacerbated the positional concerns. So I think the positional con concerns are due to in income inequality to a large extent. But so I'd like to finish my brief comments with a quote from, from Keynes. Uh, in a mature and egalitarian economy that there were some signs of in, in the 1970s already, and, and that is something that we need to return to, in my opinion. We could, and for ecological, ecological reasons actually may need to, and this is the quote that you all know, absorb some part of the unwarranted surplus by increased leisure, which are a wonderful way of getting rid of money and shorter uh, hours. So these were my brief comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that, that raises some fascinating questions. I, I had not a, a come across this concept of subjective minimum income for a start. And I think uh, the, cor the interactions between that and positional pressures and income inequality is something I'd like to ask Adair to comment on in a minute. But I thought that to start the discussion, uh, we ought to give you, Antonella, or, or, or your collaborators a chance to comment on the other papers that you've just heard uh, because they really shed some very interesting light on what you were talking about. And specifically, the question I, I'd like to ask you is, you argue that there's a need for stronger demand in order to generate stronger supply. Do you think stronger demand would overcome the arguments of on, on technology and inequality that uh, you know, were raised in, this, in the subsequent uh, two papers? Well, uh, difficult question, but uh, let me say, um, well, 
Technology, I think, has a major impact on employment, other things given. I'm not sure that technology is, on the other hand, I'm not sure that technology is the major explanation of inequality in the sense that there have been, there have been other explanations of why inequality No, but what I meant was that the impact on, of technology on lowering uh, economic activity that Adair was talking about, that capital goods are becoming so much cheaper and that generates uh, this I mean, imbalance between demand waste, and supply. In a sense, at the macroeconomic level, it's always a matter of policy mix. Some more demand, more leisure, uh, shorter working time, in the, not only lower, less working hours, but also a different lifetime cycle, so to speak. So early retirement, longer period of study, or maybe repeated uh, periods of leave in order to study or do anything else. Okay, I mean, some policy mix can always compensate for whatever, you know, is, is missing in terms of investment or employment owing to technological problems. The point is that if this mix is, I mean, requires a lot of public intervention, that may become a political problem. You have to move towards an economy where there is a quite a degree of economic planning or centralization of you know, public investment and things like that. And of course, this may be quite difficult. But in principle, you can always you know, uh, do enough to, to employ the unemployed or to have investment in infrastructure demand or lower uh, working time. That we well, that, that relates adjust. to the other question that I was going to ask you or, or Steve to comment on, which is that if we believe that there is this inherent uh, demand stagnation in the economy that has to be compensated for through uh, public policy and essentially through fiscal policy rather than monetary policy for all the reasons you've given. That seems to imply a steadily l larger rising and per per possibly perpetually rising share of uh, the public sector in the economy. Does it or is there, or, or is, it, and uh, A, does it, is that the case or, or is there some, something else go, potentially going on? And secondly, is that something that should should be worrying? You know, p political conventional wisdom these days says that this is a nightmare, but should we be worried about that, or is that just a, a, a natural part of the evolution of a capitalist mixed economy? Uh, yeah, you haven't had a chance, to, no, Daniele, to say something. I'd like to say yeah. something about yeah. this, because I think both theoretically and empirically, there are reasons to think that a higher growth rate of government spending does not need to result in a higher uh, share of the government in GDP, government spending. And uh, actually, empirically, if you look at the data for advanced countries in the period after the Second World War in which we had a higher growth rate of government spending, we, we didn't have a big increase uh, in the share of government spending. This is something I have found in some other empirical research. And also from a theoretical point of view, if you look at the very simple model like a super, super multiplier model in which uh, the supply adjusts to demand through the accelerator effect. Actually, the equilibrium result of the model will be that a higher growth rate of autonomous demand results in a lower share of mm -hmm. autonomous demand in GDP because of the reaction of investment and of consumption. So I, I'm not saying yeah. that we should not consider this issue, but it's not so straightforward empirically and theoretically that uh, fiscal expansion must result in a boom in the share of government spending in, the G in GDP. I Did you want to say I something? Yeah. This is in line with the fact that our autonomous demand grow would cause also grow in private investment. Yeah, yeah. And this is basically our point because there is not such crowding out that is usually referred by policy making and so on. Mm. Then government spending, which is a crucial component of our autonomous demand variable would not cause lower private investment. Yeah. So that has been the case empirically, but Steve, in terms of some of the arguments you're presenting about the impact of inequality on this, 
maybe we cannot rely on that in the future, right? Because if inequality continues to widen, private demand will not pick up in that way. Is, is that right? Yeah, I, I think that is correct. I, I have to add my perspective on this. I, yeah. If I look at, again, forgive me for focusing on the U.S. case, but uh, you know, there's a strong, there, there is a strong need for, for public infrastructure. There is an important need for the government to take over more of the medical care in the United States. So I think there is a uh, really a micro public finance kind of argument for higher government spending. But, but in the end, I agree with my you know, panelists here that uh, I, I don't think we have to see a rising share of government spending going forward. And in fact, my guess is that not only do we stimulate growth, we actually might need to see a restoration of private demand growth. Uh, if I look at the U.S. case right now, I don't, I mean, I think we're, we're looking at stagnation, you know, well into the future with the current kind of dynamic, uh, largely because of the inequality issue. So all these things are, are interacted. But, but do you think that's still true if we maintain the current level of inequality? Or is there another element of government intervention that would be required to make this demand and supply uh, uh, rebalancing sustainable? And that would be explicit government intervention to reverse inequality. In other words, you know, is it possible that actually uh, inequality, uh, that government policies directed towards egalitarianism, redistributive policies either through taxes or through public spending might be an equally important, even more important component than the level of aggregate government spending relative to GDP. Uh, and, and unless we have redistributional policies, the pure demand stimulus is going to keep running into the sand because of this inequality issue. Simple, simple answer was yes. Okay, right. <laughs> well, that was my little speech. Uh, Adair, what, what's well, your reaction? I, I thought yeah. Till's comments were absolutely uh, uh, taking forward what, what, what we'd said and taking it to a next stage. Because I think we have a consensus, and I think it's the right consensus, that we have economies which are growing less fast than they could uh, because they are short of aggregate uh, nominal demand. And that in that environment, we ought to be running higher fiscal deficits. Uh, and if necessary, I go to the stage of if you really wanted to, worried about the accumulation of debt, you can monetarily finance those deficits uh, within tight, disciplined uh, controls. But the question that Till asks is, OK, we have the tools. It, it's not true that we are condemned to low growth. We have a way of driving a high level of growth. But will that solve inequality? And will it be desirable in general terms? And I think those are two really great questions. I think on will it solve inequality, my answer is no. My answer is no. I think it would be, you know, in the short term, I think there is a, uh, it would have been better to have higher growth. But I do not think it would solve the inequality problem. I think where has this rise in inequality come from? Now, it's, co it's partly come. I think, from a set of political processes and institutional processes, the creation of more flexible labor markets, the deliberately destruction of trade union power, uh, the reduction of uh, high marginal tax rates on higher income people. But I think underneath it, there, I do think there has been a technological factor. I think there is something about uh, the, the world of information and communications technology that enables a very, very small uh, number of, of people to create things which are hugely valuable uh, to uh, the economy, and they will tend to get uh, a lion's share of the return to that. Uh, they then, you know, spend that money on all sorts of other things uh, which create other rich people. There's a wonderful quote from Lionel Robbins from 70 years ago that uh, the existence of many rich people uh, relies on the existence of other rich people. And once you get very rich people in one corner of the economy, they spend money on luxury goods, and the luxury goods create high income in the people who provide luxury goods, etc. So I, I think there's a technological nexus which helps explain what's happened at the top end. And I think at the bottom end, I simply think it is the case that we now have technologies which are increasingly going to enable us to automate away more and more jobs. I think in a completely and utterly flexible labor market, People will find jobs, but they will find jobs at equilibrium real wage rates, which are not sufficient uh, to make them sort of equal citizens of society. So to your point, uh, Anto, I do not think we can avoid in this environment an overtly redistributive debate about how much we uh, redistribute. And I don't think faster growth in itself uh, will solve uh, the problems. As for whether it's desirable, um, 
I think there are ecological limits. And also there is, as Till says, a collective action problem. I mean, is it rational that, broadly speaking, after some reductions in the uh, average working week between sort of 1900 uh, down to sort of 1960, we, we've sort of stopped those. And broadly speaking, we take all the improvements in productivity uh, that we achieve uh, from technological application and we use them entirely uh, in terms of attempted uh, higher income rather than greater leisure. Uh, is that a, a truly optimal choice or in a true uh, free choice, or is it something which is driven by a collective action problem? I suspect there is a collective action problem here. I do, I do, be do believe that the more we go on uh, creating uh, material wealth and service wealth, the more that, as Keynes also puts it in, in the general theory, we get devoted uh, to buying those goods and services, what was the phrase, that, that put us above, that make us superior, that makes us feel superior to our fellows, uh, rather than things which, in, in a sense, are likely to make us uh, ultimately uh, long-term happier. So I, I, don't, I, yeah, I don't know the resolution of that, but I think that is absolutely the question to ask, because I think the, uh, uh, and actually I will come, I'll come back to this uh, at our evening discussion, the question of why uh, the vision which Keynes sets out in Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, in which by this time we ought to be all uh, working 15-hour weeks, well, why has it not occurred, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think, uh, I'm not going to suggest an answer to it, but I think it's a damn good question. Well, I've been told we've got to wind up, but I, I just want to, to give Till a last word, because you're the only one on the panel who hasn't commented, and I think you raise this very interesting idea that actually income inequality is one of the things that leads to the positional pressures, which is what uh, Adair is also referring to. Uh, another option is that society just breaks up, just divides into two completely different classes, the elite and the proletariat, who do not interact. And to some extent, we see that going on in politics today. So, uh, you know, just a final one minute, what's your reaction to everything we've discussed here in this fascinating conversation? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I agree, uh, Anatole, that there is this risk of a separation of, let's say, two classes in society, uh, the rich and, and what you call the proletariat, that then don't see each other as reference groups anymore, mm -hmm. so they don't compete for positional goods. And so that's why I'm also find very problematic these proposals of an unconditional basic income, for example, because this could actually um, like stabilize these, these two groups and they could um, live alongside each other, but um, so, and, and they wouldn't care about relative um, um, concerns and, 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 and position anymore. But what I find, there is a collective action problem. I agree, I agree with that. But I would also re-emphasize the point that the rise in inequality in itself has exacerbated these positional concerns. Because I think from psychology we know that these status comparisons are upward looking. So we always compare ourselves to others that are somewhat above ourselves in the um, income distribution ladder. And so when income inequality increases, um, those um, who lose out in terms of relative income, they have different options in, uh, when, if they want to um, keep up with the rich in terms of positional goods, consumption. They can um, reduce uh, um, uh, their leisure, they can work more, they can save less, and saving, uh, uh, old age pension savings and, and, and um, um, sound individual balance sheets these are also non-positional goods. You cannot show off with a, yeah. with a, with a, with a sound balance sheet and, 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 <laughs> and sufficient savings, and they, they, they went into debt. And, and so um, w with a more equitable distribution of income, I think it, it becomes a much easier choice for middle class and even upper middle class um, 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 families to opt for uh, non-positional goods um, rather than, than, than positional goods, because this is clearly a, a very deep concern for the middle class and, and, and upper middle class to send their, their kids to the best schools that, that money can buy, to have relatively good health care, to live in the relatively attractive uh, residential areas, and, and, and so on. So, um, uh, but, but, but if the income share of the top uh, income groups was reduced, then these positional um, arms races would be 
would be uh, somewhat, somewhat weaker. And actually in the statistics, there was one interesting uh, paper by, by uh, Emmanuel Saz and, and Gabriel Zuckmann. They show that um, the, the saving rate uh, declined especially in the percentiles 90 to 99 uh, or 95 in the wealth distribution in the US. So th these are precisely those peoples that had the strongest uh, decrease in relative incomes compared to the top 1%. And, and, and so there, I think there is some evidence that, yes, there is a collective action problems, but by reducing the income inequality, we can also, to some extent, um, solve the, 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 the positional arms races. Sorry for being Well, I would love to have an opportunity to summarize this uh, wonderful discussion, but we've got to get off the stage. We've got to have lunch. Uh, but I think you all agree that was a fantastic way to launch a conference that's going to deal with all these Anatole, issues. Anatole, I want to commend you. This was a fantastic discussion, and I dare say I think this was INET's first ever podiumless discussion, uh, looking at Laura Turner, who, who raised that point. So I think I've just invented a new word. But I want to thank the panel. I want to thank Anatole Koleski for really helping us to reawaken beautifully. Thank you all very much.